Hi, this is Tom Lomberg, the Chief Curator and Curator of History at the Evansville Museum of Arts, History, and Science, welcoming you to another exciting episode of Tipsy Topics with Tori and Tom. We always have something very interesting and very fun for you to look at, to see, and to hear. We have some great guests with us today, Tori. Tori Shindle Cox, our Virginia G. Schrader Curator of Art, has gathered together a fabulous collection of costumes, and even more importantly, a fabulous collection of friends and a co-worker to talk to us today about our exhibit, Escapism, Finding Solace During the Great Depression. So that the show gets better, I'll stop talking and turn it over to Tori <laughs> and we'll head on with tipsy topics. Well, hello, and look at this, we're live We're live person. with people, yeah. yay! For the first time in almost one year, so thank you for all your patronage for over that long, horrible time called COVID. But luckily we're here to come together and we have the lovely Mike Gaines over here who's going to talk about how he helped cultivate this exhibition. And we also have Rachel, who some of you may know as our Director of Development, but what if I told you that she is a conservationist? So we'll get into that um, here shortly, but Rachel, would you like to say anything? Um, sure, I'm excited to be at the museum. I've been here um, about eight months, and being a part of this project has just been icing on the cake, so oh. it's really exciting to be here. <laughs> and we have our lovely friend Mike over here with that big, beautiful beard smile. <laughs> It, Tori called me out of the blue and asked if I would come look at something and having no idea what it would be and I popped in and all of a sudden she's opening boxes of exquisite gowns and from the golden era and I'm like, oh, holy, uh, <laughs> quite flattered to ask my opinion on anything. So I before, loved every moment of it. Before we hear more from our special guest, Tori, where did we get all this? So these dresses were gifted to us in 1962. Um, Siegfried Wang was doing a fashion show exhibition and um, fundraiser to raise money for a Jewish hospital. And what's really great, some of the models, yes, models that wore some of these dresses, um, they were Evansville women, and some of their descendants are actually members on our museum today. So it was really great to even go through the archives and see who was in those dresses. But also, my favorite uh, picture, which we'll have to show, on this is Siegfried Wang is in the middle of all these fabulous women. You could just see in the black and white photo, his face turning red. <laughs> and so that was how we first got these dresses. So we were the last um, uh, venue on the stop. So they said, hey, you want these? We said, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kelly's Corp. And then in 1983, John Streetman III and Mary Bauer, um, now director, and John being the former director, they did an exhibition with the um, dresses and then they actually paired it with photography from MoMA. And so what was great is we were able to keep those photos in our archives, we did get the rights to them. And that's what you see back here is some of those MoMA photography. And so to give it a new twist in 2021, um, Tom and I decided to uh, put these dresses in the Great Depression sense um, and talk about how Hollywood really helped um, really the, the mentality and how to actually be a boost in uh, American thought process. And really, Tom's the best one to ask for that. Just so people could learn about how people escaped, at least momentarily, the Great Depression. Not much money out in the Midwest. There's the dust storms going on. So you find a little solace in seeing what people on the silver screen were doing during what was really the golden age of Hollywood. So those two went hand in hand. So it's a great way to use our permanent collection and to display it, what what did you say for the third time? Yeah, third time. For the third time third only. Time. Yeah. So that's that's amazing. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and so let's go take a look at some of these dresses. So this was a fun one, I think, for everybody because we have the mommy dearest gown here. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we first looked at this, Mike was really uh, influential in showing us how this dress actually would go on the mannequin because you have to remember these dresses were in boxes. I don't know textiles that well. That's one reason why I wanted to do this exhibition so I could learn. And also I have fabulous friends who could teach me along the way too. So this was very community driven. Um, but Rachel definitely brought in the expertise when it came to do this dress in particular. And Rachel, you might tell us some of the work you did on this dress and sure. a little bit about your background. Oh, too. sure. sure. <laughs> um, so I kind of fell into it in college. I took a class on costuming and then started working in the costume shop. Um, a lot of hems, a lot of welt pockets while I was there. <laughs> and um, it was just exciting probably up until this job, my favorite job that I've ever had. Um, and so after that, I've done alterations and um, things like that for friends and family. 
just to keep sewing. So that's kind of just my background that I, I worked two or three years whenever I was in college in a costume shop. No, I hate to ask there. because I know the answer. Where was college? Uh, Purdue University. Yes. Oh, well. <laughs> No, it's a great, our, yeah. our great friends up north. <laughs> my IU years were ten; they didn't here. Yeah, okay. mine were ten. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so on this piece, there was a lot of uh, bead repair that we did, um, beads that had started to come off, and then there were some seams, especially um, along the waist here, that we reattached, and um, there was a little else. There was a little bit along the um, the seam along the um, bottom of the dress too that we that we repaired. Working with something of this age, and maybe more so on the others, are there real special challenges or things that to be really mindful of when you're working on something that's a number of decades old in a very specific style? I think specifically the beads, I was very careful not to lose any <laughs> and uh, or break any whenever I was, you know, repairing the sections. And um, there were a couple of, I think, clasps and um, eye hooks that we replaced that I wanted to make sure we didn't have the exact right one, so I didn't want them to be. So that, yeah, so that it, it kept its, its uh, original state. Well, it was also fortunate, because I know when we first met with Mike, we were talking about some of these needs of attention. And getting attention and doing it in a professional fashion, not something that is come by inexpensively. So we were really fortunate that you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Mike? Sure. First of all, Rachel was a hidden treasure to be able to <laughs> do the work that she did on these gowns, because so many of them you're seeing in a 3D form now, they would not have withstood that in the form in which we looked at them in the archival boxes. With vintage clothing, often the fabric will still be strong, but the seams grow weak, the threads. And pieces like this beautiful draped beading here, it naturally breaks down over time, and this is all glass. And this would have, each one of these would have been sewn by hand. So being able to do the work that Rachel did, it's the art of a couturier, and it's, a masterpiece. It really is to be able to bring these back to life from when we couldn't even lift them up and just even hold them in a flat, upright fashion for fear of the pieces disintegrating. Mike, I, I marvel at your expertise when you're going through these with us. How, how did you come about this? How did you come to this knowledge? I am not an expert on anything, first of all. <laughs> I, reading things, always having an interest, in, always enjoying old movies. Uh, I was fortunate to be exposed throughout my life to haute couture and you better prêt à porter wear, attending fashion shows, and I, of course, I've worked as a jewelry designer for most of my life. So I've had a foot in the fashion industry as well, both with uh, Hojo Joaillier fine jewelry, as well as very high fashion uh, bridge pieces and all of that. That is, you know, attending runway shows and everything's kind of what we mean by that now. And plus being around fabulous clothes, my, with my mother who dressed exquisitely, my grandmother's and all of that. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Well, on that, uh, there's some fun facts you've told me about this black and white combination. It looks like a tuxedo. Can you tell our viewers a little bit of that? Oh, I'm trying to even remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to put you on the spot. <laughs> the mind is old. It, it's like Swiss cheese. Um, well, first of all, this would create a silhouette that is very slimming and draws the eye into the most elegant and sexual positions on the actress. Because it's highlighting the bodice breast area as well as lower. It is very sexy without showing anything off. It's hiding, but also titillating and exhilarating at the same time. The natural drape follows the beautiful body curve and like the curve of Praxedales, which is the ancient Greek standard for sculpture, if you know, there's a slight S curve. And also this somewhat blends in to Marlena Dietrich going in toward her uh, and Greta Garbo as well, more androgynous look when they were doing tuxedos, because you can almost get a tuxedo-ish feel from some of that. Mm -hmm. Well, which is all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was tickled pink to be invited <laughs> to look at them. <laughs> well, if you're tickled pink, what about our pink dress over uh, here? Ladies. <laughs> Tom, I'll wait for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll move along. <laughs> and so, 
This dress is Carol Lombard. Um, it's definitely special to me because Carol Lombard was originally from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and that was my birthplace. Um, but also, when we were going through the photos before we actually got to the dresses, this was one of the most extreme dresses because it has that big V-neck, beautiful belt, and just beads, beads, beads. And what was really cool about this dress is uh, Mike not only showed us that how we were originally displaying it wasn't correct, <laughs> and that um, the V-neck that you see here wasn't as um, extreme as what we saw in the archive pictures. So it was really interesting to see once we got this piece on the dress and actually got to see the movie in which she wore this to get a better idea of what this is. But what I thought was really interesting was that Mike told me about the collecting of the belts. And I'm going to let you take that over. Well, the belt would have been, uh, all those pieces are hand-set Swarovski crystals. Uh, they were coming out of parts of Europe that have now been, it was Bohemia, Czechoslovakia, and they, those borders are always drawn in pencil, of course. That belt <laughs> draws your eye right there to the simple bodice, and the red would have popped on this dress because A, would not have shown as red on a black and white film, and this dress would not have shown as its pinkish flesh color on a black and white film. It would have appeared gray, and when light hits that on a set or going down a runway, this would have just sparkled like a disco ball or a diamond necklace. <laughs> it would have been stunning. It would have been such subtle elegance that it would take your breath away. It would absolutely take your breath away. Also, the weight of this beading, there again, this is Rachel's specialty. That gown. 25, 30 pounds. It was easily, a lot heavier than I expected. Yeah, yeah easily yes. 25 or 30 yes. pounds, just in the weight of glass. And there again, each of those would have been hand sewn by seamstresses at the studios to create these pieces. The belt, I looked at back and forth, and I think it was added at the last minute. And wow. it really kind of pops the whole thing. So, and Carol Lombard was, of course, the wife of Clark Gable. Yeah. The uh, king and queen of Hollywood in some way. Well, yes. technically, Norma Shearer was the mother queen of Hollywood. True. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I look at these and I look at the belt. I look at these women had extremely slender waists. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, were they being required to stay at a certain level by their movie companies and such as that? Oh, yes. The old studio system essentially owned the stars, they controlled where they appeared in uh, social circumstances, where they dined, with, with whom they dined, what they wore, everything. The old studio system was almost feudal in its uh, treatment of, especially starlets, as they worked their way up. Uh, Betty Davis and uh, Joan Crawford fought it later on. Uh, Betty Davis basically broke free through absolutely feuding with Jack Warner, who was the head of the MGM, if I remember correctly. But they would, you know, orchestrate and script everything. And all this was being photographed for magazines, which were the Facebook of the day. And they wanted their stars to appear as larger than life. These were the Kardashians, yeah. essentially but much better behaved <laughs> <laughs> on camera and in uh, print. There's yeah. you know, old stories, you know, there are fixers in Hollywood, just as in politics, but they would erase histories, buy up copies of photos or films that were... Well, to me, even it, some pregnancies were sort oh, of... Oh, pregnancies Ooh. were always handled. Yeah. There's a running joke uh, about Doris Day that um, Oscar Levant knew her before she was a virgin. Hmm. <laughs> uh, Joan Crawford, whose gown we saw there. Yes. The, oh, I can't remember which producer it is off the top of my head. I want to say Mayer spent vast sums buying copies of an erotic movie she had done mm -hmm. in her very late teens, early 20s, to buy up every copy of it so she could appear pristine. Mm -hmm. It was smoke and mirrors in many ways. Um, and the other interesting thing about this, we think of movies today as driving fashion. It was the other way around then. Fashion is what sold the movies. And you would have so much pre-publicity of pictures of stars in these gowns before the movie was even released. And women were the primary person choosing the entertainment of that period. So that's why there are so many female-driven stories of that age that we remember. 
scale. You either had something ultra glamorous, such as you see portrayed around us, or you had something you know, such as the Grapes of Wrath that was, you know, what uh, other people's life was like. That's right. This allowed them to escape. Yeah. And the designers that did these were, their work was incredible. You know, Edith Head, Ori Kelly, Travis ba uh, Banton, Irene Sharaf, there's, they go on and on. Adrian was another one. Uh, even Coco Chanel designed yeah. for Hollywood in the early 30s. Mm -hmm. She designed for Gloria Swanson, and, um, but they're, they did not get along, so she was back in Paris by 1931. <laughs> 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 smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. Of Adrian, we actually have some um, gowns designed by Adrian. So what a gown. This one threw all of us for a loop. <laughs> what we ended up learning is quite possibly when this uh, dress was used for the fashion show that maybe some alterations were made because the dress was actually sold backwards when we uh, pulled it out of the boxes in 2021. And it almost looked like it was a pantsuit, so it almost looked like it had two legs and then this sash in front of it. And after we really dissected it, got Rachel involved and Mary Bauer, our director, who also is extremely knowledgeable when it comes to fashion, we looked at the headlines, looked at the gowns, uh, sorry, the gown, and then compared it to the movie that this um, dress was featured in and realized that this was backwards. <laughs> so <laughs> Rachel had to quite literally take the dress apart and resew it correctly so that it would actually form how it was supposed to be worn in the movie. But also, it was really cool. She even had to um, create this belt. So for some reason, the belt wasn't with the dress um, at all. And we went through our archives to see if it was even in the 1962 fashion show, and it wasn't. So uh, we were able to look at the movie to see that this dress, I'm sorry, that this uh, belt was supposed to be here in this girdle. And so once we started to put this dress back together, it actually is a dress. Because <laughs> Mike and I stared at this thing for so long oh. trying to figure out yeah, what yeah, leg we, went through where. Like, like every different direction. And, Safely, of course. Know, there's, there's actually a lead weight sewn into yes. the bottom of it. So it was almost functioning, we thought, like an Indian dhoti yes. would have been worn because there's a lot of Indian subcontinent influence in this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it threw us for a loop. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm like, uh, I got nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so this dress is from um, the movie The Perfect Marriage to give context to that. But yeah, it was a perfect conundrum, so we had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's so great about this process. Now we know more and we have it presented in the authentic way. And what a find. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Rachel, tell us a little bit of what you looked, what, what didn't you do for this? <laughs> <laughs> easier. Well, first of all, we I feel like we put it on and on off the dress form maybe four or five times before we figured out the, the correct orientation of how we thought the skirt. I spent an entire day <laughs> dressing a mannequin, <laughs> sweating, trying to stay dry as possible for the integrity of the art, <laughs> and maybe saying some few choice words in an undisclosed location with this dress. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually we came to the realization that the, the zipper that we thought was on the side was should have gone in the back and then it fit her shape the appropriate way once we discovered that. And then all the pieces kind of started coming together. So um, I disassembled the dress because it was all in one piece and it's now a, a top and a skirt um, because it, it fits a little bit better. And then um, I a lot of the beads had to be repaired again. Um, that was a big process. And um, and then, like I said, uh, or like Tori said, we had to uh, make a new belt to match. And we had one reference photo, so I took a little bit of artistic um, liberty there to, <laughs> to make the belt that I, I thought fit the dress. And the biggest factor was to match the color. So the fabric isn't exactly the same, but it, I think it matches the color pretty well. It's exquisite. Yeah. It is. If, if anyone that did not know that that was added would never figure it out because it fits period, it flows beautifully with this pleating, which is very much like a Fortuny style pleating. And this top piece is actually a separate bolero jacket. And you know, you just what you were able to do with this, phenomenal. It's beautiful. You are an artist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> and then it, what you cannot see is it has a beautiful drape in the back that just highlights the form. It could, you would almost think it was a hood in some ways to be brought up. So, and then all of the color of the crystals there again, though you are seeing intense red and pearl and gold on camera now, that would not have been decipherable in a black and white movie. So sometimes our the colors are different, but that was just stunning. stunning. <laughs> stay at this dress all day. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, too, this beautiful little eyebrow here. Uh, Rachel, I'm completely your parent. Mm -hmm. um, just like Mike said earlier, um, the fabric and the stitching, it just fell apart with time. Um, they are, these dresses are stored in uh, acid-free boxes, acid-free tissue, uh, temperature controlled, but 1962 to 2021, <laughs> and I highly doubt there's any conservation with them in uh, the 1983 exhibition. Um, maybe Mary or John, who the watches can correct me. Um, so <laughs> that's a long period of time to have that natural process because everything we bring into the museum does have a shelf life. And so mine and Tom's job as curators or stewards is to prolong that shelf life for as long as possible so the next generation of museum goers can appreciate these pieces. So that's why when I get asked, well, why isn't this piece still on display? Well, again, because whenever you put it on display, it's going to fade, it's going to crack, it's going to fall apart. And so that's why we have to rotate things out. And that's also why we have to have such a large um, permanent collection. So we not only correct um, the human experience through the physical and spiritual object of belief of these gowns, but we need to make sure we rotate them so that we're doing the good steward job with Rachel Self and Mike's knowledge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, to make sure that we have these the next museum goers and the textiles because of how much gravity, weight, and light is being stressed on these. It might take another 10, 12 years to bring these back out, or maybe 30, 40, so that'll be the next curator. It's a, uh, woo, I don't know, Tom. <laughs> well, I know you won't be here now. And you may be. <laughs> and especially with textiles, like I said, the fabric will stand longer than the threads. But if you notice, there is some discoloration if you can get in very close here. Human perspiration where these were worn or makeup that had rubbed off of the models when they did the fashion show oh, would yeah. have it there again in, uh, in soaked into the fibers and that will cause them to deteriorate over time. Yeah. Uh, for anyone who is wearing a beautiful evening gown, whether it is vintage or something new, Put it on 15 minutes after your cosmetics are all done. <laughs> <laughs> and then have it promptly cleaned afterwards if you want to save it for the future. Same thing should go for your jewelry. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. The body is willing, but often the seams are weak, and then when chemicals interact with fabrics and or, you know, silk has a problem becoming what's called shot. Yes. And, um, or shattered, I'm sorry, shattered silk, and that's when the weave breaks down. Even though silk is one of the strongest fibers known to mankind. Yep. And it's traumatized when you see it. <laughs> Stronger than the same size filament of steel. Ooh. Higher than plus. Yeah. Stronger than Elizabeth Taylor's marriages? <laughs> yeah. Those are very strong. That's not a very high bar. Yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> well, speaking of marriages and strong willed women, let's go to Norma Shear. <laughs> <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about Norma Shearer? <laughs> Norma Shearer was actually born in Canada. And in some ways, she has some similarities to Grace Kelly. Literally, she was born into a wealthy family. However, they lost their fortune. She always wanted to be a star. So eventually, her mother and her sister, she came to America. Uh, she started doing bit player. She was not the best actress in the world. She was good. She did get an Oscar nod. Um, she was not the most beautiful woman of Hollywood of the period, but she knew how to marry well. And she married Irving Thalberg, who was basically the king of Hollywood. Uh, and there again, the studio heads controlled everything. She had, would have the best of the best. She had any pick of her roles that she wanted. Um, her clothing was always exquisite, handmade. And also at this time, too, when we think of designers now, we think, you know, the House of Chanel, Balenciaga, and, and all of those. Back then, people thought of Ori Kelly, Adrian, and Edith Head as much as we think of 
the designer houses. You don't hear those names now other than once a year at the Oscars for the you know, best costuming. Yeah. yeah, Norma Shear was the queen of Hollywood. She could make you or break you. Uh, her husband passed away fairly young. But one thing, if you go back and watch any old movies with Norma Shearer in them, and many of these actresses as well, and this is from my standpoint of being a jeweler, the jewelry they're wearing, most of the time, is their own. Their own pieces that they own, and they're real. She had an incredible jewelry collection. Um, Joan Crawford, uh, who's dressed from Lady Linson, which was the first one we looked at. In women, the women, the women, the 1939 version, she's wearing 130 carat citrine mm -hmm. yes. in an art moderne style piece. And that was her own, from her own personal collection. When she divorced um, Franchot, Fong, as a gift, he gave her an over 100 carat amethyst ring. I'm like, how civilized, you've got to love that. <laughs> I don't think um, that happens in most divorce cases. No, no. <laughs> no. You know, you're more calibers instead of calibers. Yeah, 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 yeah. um, <laughs> Norma Shear would, you know, this dress, she would have probably worn an exquisite earring with. You would not necessarily, you would not put a necklace with this. There may have, maybe have been a brooch down here at the waist, possibly. But you have so much ornamentation and decoration that you don't want to overwhelm the dress. You let it speak for itself. But her jewelry collection was exquisite. Mm -hmm. And there again, most movies of hers that if you look at, you'll notice them, unless she's playing a downscale character, which so many of the 30 movies, 30s and 40s movies weren't, they were upscale, so people could escape. You'll see a huge marquee diamond mm -hmm. ring on her finger. And that was her engagement ring. So <laughs> it was about 12 and a half carats, if I remember correctly. Yes. Yeah. Do you have any sense for her fellow stars in Hollywood, their feelings toward her because she had this real <laughs> leg up? Uh, yes. <laughs> she was considered a nice person. Okay. By and large. Joan Crawford couldn't stand her. Mm -hmm. And they performed together with many of the other top actresses of the period. They're again referencing the movie The Women in 1939. And she, Joan Crawford was a, still a newer actress at that point. And she's like, how the hell am I going to compete with that? <laughs> and she was kind of bitter about it. Yeah. So, so, in the part that Joan Crawford played in that movie, she was trying to steal Norma Shearer's husband. And <laughs> if only it were true for her. Right? She, well, she stole a few husbands in her day. <laughs> 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 it was a precursor. <laughs> yes, yes. So, but if you ever want to see Park Avenue life, of the late 1930s. Get the movie The Women, 1939 version, not the horrid 2000 yeah. versions. And the funny thing too is there are no men in the cast. Yeah. And you have to listen closely to the dialogue because it's fast, 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 and bitchy as hell. <laughs> 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 yeah. But yes, Norma Shear was definitely the queen of Hollywood. And what's really interesting too is when I was diving more into um, who Norma Shear was and how she was um, viewed, so that's a good question. Um, there's some interesting parallels with how um, Shear was being discussed, especially in, in, in the magazines that you see today. So look at this dress. My God, she's itty bitty. She literally is the size of two of my hands, and that's it. Um, she was um, basically described as having fat, fat thighs, a fat face. She was disproportionately correct. She was so, like Mike said, ugly. She had that view of ugliness. Yet when I saw the women in 1939, I thought she was absolutely marvelous. She was beautiful, and I thought her proportions were well. Um, and so that's so interesting to bring that up and how we judge and look at women today, even, especially mm -hmm. on the silver screen. So now it's starting to change, but... It's gosh. starting to change, but it will never change completely. Yeah. You, you know, you have a medieval background and renaissance and all that, think back to them. Yeah. Also, to create this silhouette, there was incredible amounts of foundation garments. Not as much as if it were the 18th or 19th century with, but there were still, they were corseted and girdled and, yeah. you know, things came down to here to enhance the thighs. Unless there was a skirt that was high slit, then it would be short and they had to work out. Mm -hmm. The studios put together classes and workout programs and uh, for all of them, they strictly controlled their diet, classes in elocution, how to walk, how to speak, etiquette, mm -hmm. proper table manners. I, I want to know what all 
your impressions on this. this was fun. Sure. Rachel's impression yes. is far more important than mine. <laughs> I feel like this is another one that we went back and forth because we had two reference photos that were different as to yes. how um, the silhouette was. And do we have to go back to the actual movie? So what was great is, um, so Tom could relate to me a little bit more. When curators are getting an exhibition done, we have maybe four or five weeks before everything has to go on display mm -hmm. and everything goes wrong, of course, because uh, when you're making an exhibition, it's the Alps. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it looks like from start to finish. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the highs, the lows. Yeah. And um, so I was just trying to get these dresses on the mannequin, get them in good condition that was safe to display them, of course, working with Rachel. And Rachel comes up with um, a screenshot from the film, and she goes, Tori, look. This dress is wrong. They're like, oh my god, thank goodness! We're yeah. like two weeks away from opening it up to show. And um, I think I had this this piece, uh, I forget, it was under the arm or under the arm. Yeah. And the sleeve, I can't remember, the sleeve was a little bit different. But yeah. uh, after that, I feel like it was a pretty easy repair. There were yeah. a couple of seams that we fixed. And then I did some temporary reinforcement, just knowing that it was going to be on display for this long to take some of the stress off of off of some of the seams because it is it is pretty heavy as well. Yeah. Um, so after after I corrected you. Yes, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was pretty easy. It's a yes. great, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That's the way we like to be corrected. We want to have it correct. That's right. Because um, Rachel also corrected Clara Bow. Um, she noticed that there was supposed to be a belt. I totally missed that. And how the boa, I had it the wrong way at first. I had the boa going behind the neck because I'm thinking, Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't Viva Las Vegas. The boa decades, goes in front. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then the tails, too, on uh, Barbara Stanswick, um, her, her gown, if you will. So what's really cool about this dress, and we'll, we'll walk over to this one. And so this is Barbara Stainswick's dress, but as you can see here, it's a top, and then we have this skirt that almost looks like pants, but it is a skirt. And the belt actually ties in the front and hangs down. So while Mike and I were talking about this, it's more of like a tuxedo-esque look to it. Um, I thought the tails would go in the back because in the traditional talk that's where it was. But then again, Rachel so said, fun. hey, look, <laughs> there's a picture like, you know, as the curator of art, she'd probably have known that. <laughs> but that's okay. Well, yeah, you're Second set of eyes. In it's value, right. it's absolutely invaluable. So yep. creating these. Well, then, that minor embarrassment at the moment is always worth having it right for visitors in the right. museum. Is the way mm -hmm. I, I agree that. too. Mm -hmm. So that's the wonderful thing about this job is um, I don't ever try to be perfect because it's, it's just not going to happen. Because no. um, there are people that know a lot more just because, you know, I have a friend that was a curator, so my knowledge is an inch deep and a mile long, but we get these folks who depth of knowledge is much deeper than ours to help us out. That's, that's right. what's fabulous. Like Mike and Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's why it's so important to do these community engagement exhibitions because, um, not only do you get better and more accurate information, um, Tom and I don't have PhDs. We have a mastery in a very obscure topic. We like to read, we like to learn, but we're just not going to yeah. learn it all. So that's why we need each other to really lean on to learn from. And to get wonderful conservation work that I can't afford. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so that's what we were terrified about. That's right. We were yeah. like, uh, New York, Chicago, places I can think of, and yeah. we've been far beyond your budget just to even have one gown worked on, let that's alone. Right. The work you're able to do across the entire collection. Yeah, so. it's been a dream. It was just a dream to be able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and to give a little reference point, it would be about ten to fifteen thousand dollars per dress to get properly cleaned and fixed. So mm -hmm. really, we can't thank Rachel enough for that. Oh. And then, uh, which is about ten times our entire budget. For this. <laughs> 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 That's right. Not to tell too many secrets, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta always show that fun aspect, but. Yeah, it was really great to learn about this. Um, and Mike, can you tell me again what these little uh, beads are called? Like Hi ants. Hi ants, thank you. I forgot Large already. Sequins. <laughs> sequins on steroids. Sequins on steroids. <laughs> yes. The other fun thing about this, if I may. Oh, please, I was hoping you would. <laughs> <laughs> when we opened the archi archival box and it was there, and we were looking at the uh, manifest for the box, it listed the gown, and there's two pieces. It's more of a bolero type jacket. The skirting and the belt, and then I'm sorry, four pieces. Her purse. And I took one look at this chiffon 
with a few pie ads on it. I said, that's not a purse. That's called a snoo. <laughs> and Tori looked at me and she goes, what's a snoo? I said, yes. that's a headdress. Yes. You would have put, taken your hair and put it into a low chignon and then worn it over the head. They're very common in the 40s. And unfortunately, you can't display it due to security reasons for fear of somebody walking away with it. But it added that final little touch to it of formality that was sheer. You completely saw her beautiful hair, mm -hmm. but just it just enough to still be intriguing. Mm -hmm. And a little paillette here and there added sparkle to the face. And for viewers, they can go out and amaze their friends with the word shoe. That's <laughs> right. How many know that word? And if you're a fan of Bob Hope, which I learned later in uh, what's that Christmas movie he's in? No, no, white, Christmas. white Christmas, white Christmas, thank you. <laughs> when he asked one of the sisters if uh, they have their snoot in a twist for having mm -hmm. a bad attitude, I know what that means. They'd rather be in their panties in a twist. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the more formalized version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have my snoot in my underwear tonight, we'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> the simple thing is to skip underwear. <laughs> That's cool. Cool. Again, let, let me tell you, foundation garments are everything when you're dealing with easy <laughs> wear and bias cut fabrics. That's right. Because <laughs> they form to the body like liquid. That's right. And speaking of liquid, let's look at Marlene Dietrich here for a bit. We want to talk about that silk. I'm so grateful that the pleats and the silk still intact from so long because we got very lucky with this. A uh, very simple, elegant dress, but. I'm going to let Mike talk about how she was a sex symbol and then so <laughs> why this dress from desire is so important. Yeah, the dress is very sheer silk with exquisite pleating. It almost appears to be like a negligee. You could imagine her going to bed in this or some very elegant woman, and then you look at the train coming in the back also with more pleating. Also notice in its construction the extraordinary subtle sexuality of where there is gathered, up at the bodice and also lower. It is saying, look at me, look at attention, I am sexy, I am gorgeous, without shouting it or showing anything off. That's the hallmark of the class of these ladies. And like I said, this down there again, often appears very much like a negligee. Uh, in the 90s, Glory, uh, uh, Goldie Hawn wore a gown very similar to this, the Oscars that you thought she had actually come out on the stage in her pinoir. Um, <laughs> the pleating that you see, especially on some of the dresses, that is very tight and was held. And this is a sample of here. It was developed by uh, Mario Fortuny, who was an Italian couturier. And those pleats were still in that dress when we lifted it out of the box after being packed away for. 60 years. Mm -hmm. There's pieces of fortune pleading from the 1920s that look like they're wearing it today. Oh my gosh. So, gosh. Now just imagine this dress in movement. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at everything static, but just imagine how some of these would have appeared actually on the form as the mo as the actress would slink and move properly, and for the, the exact lighting to hit them just the way the director, producer wanted it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was sex, pure sex. And it's so simple, but yet so elegant. Yeah. And Rachel, there wasn't much work you had to do on it, was there? Um, it was a lot of seams, and then we did put in a temporary, um, two temporary straps, because um, oh, yeah. the two that were on there were kind of mm -hmm. disintegrating. We didn't want it to uh, hang up for yeah. 15 weeks on the strap. So yeah. other than that, it was in great shape. And uh, like you said, the pleats are just incredible. I couldn't believe what shape they were. Yeah, and none of these gowns were actually pressed really or anything. You don't press those type of pleats in. It's in the creation of the gown. And there was maybe some light steaming done to some of them yes. because you can't steam too much for fear of weakening threads and losing sequins and beading and all of that. But uh, Melena Dietrich is also known for her androgyny in movies. She appeared in a tuxedo and a top hat and a uh, cigarette holder, and it was quite shocking for its day to, to be dressed as a man. Um, the first one to really do it was Greta Garbo, which is, this is her gown. She did it in a 1929 movie where she dressed up in her male lover's apparel to go out. And that was some of the first times of seeing women in pants in film. Because it just wasn't, women didn't wear pants then unless they were actually farming or riding something so mm -hmm. 
Well, I think Rachel should also should be telling us a lot about this too because this is her specialty. I didn't actually even touch this dress. Oh, oh yeah. okay. This one was in perfect shape. So. <laughs> it, it really was in perfect shape. This dress was worn by Greta Garbo. It would have been early 1930s. You're noticing an Egyptian revival feel in the collar there. And that is something that started appearing in fashion and jewelry after the discovery of the tomb of uh, King Tut Ahamun, King Tut. And um, it transferred for about 10 years thereafter in numerous pieces or numerous styles and uh, accessories. It would be called the cold shoulder. For the last uh, 10 years or so, you've been seeing women wear sh sh uh, shirts with their shoulder bared here, this area, but off here, and called it the cold shoulder look. It's not new. There was nothing new on the horizon. This was the original version of this. Ironically, this dress is so, which would be, like I said, right around 1930, is so similar to a dress that my mother owned that was an Oscar de la Renta that she wore at my sister's wedding. And when the box, when Tori lifted the lid off the box and folded the tissue back, I kind of sucked in my breath. <laughs> and I said, may I take a picture of this? And she agreed, and I sent it to my sister, and she goes, it looks like mom's dress. <laughs> and my mom wore the dress one time, and that was my sister's wedding. But the, there again, that shows that style and elegance are truly timeless. They cross 70, 80 years. Even when some of these dresses that the color may not be flattering today, picture this in black with silver here. Oh. You could go through any evening gala and be the best dressed woman in the world. The other thing about this dress, Beating and decoration is minimal. They're only at the belt and the neck. But everything about it says power and strength. It's literally a don't F with me dress. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a strong woman. There again, she was also, she took what role she wanted. She didn't play the Hollywood game. Uh, she was the one that was normally misquoted as saying, I want to be alone. <laughs> Which was a Swedish expression, but that was a paraphrase taken from one of her movies. So I feel like I'm just blathering. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do here. That's what we do. My, my, can I ask you this? You, you've referred to a lot of these gowns ex accentuate sexuality. Mm -hmm. And this is the era after the Hayes Code had come out where in plot lines and in storylines, you couldn't really get into that. Exactly. So were the designers thinking of that? Oh, very much so. No matter whether it was, you know, 1700, 1800, 1900, 20, or 2000, sex sells. Mm -hmm. And the Hayes Bureau, which became the Hollywood censorship, movies of the teens and 20s were actually extraordinarily risque. And I know that you're quite familiar with that. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> I'm going to No, we, we chatted the history of that. I'm not going to imply anything. It's a casual conversation. Casual conversation. <laughs> By the way, I need my tapes back. Oh, Movies have become extraordinarily risque for that day, and even by some of our own standards today. They would have definitely been R-rated films with the portrayals of sexuality and nudity and that. So the government got in on it and said, rein them back in. You know, it's got to play in Peoria without shocking those people. So there again, they had to cover up and you know make the storylines less uh, controversial. <laughs> Boudoir had to be elegant, you know, rather than other things showing. So um, and Clara Bow, whose dress is there, was one of she was of that era of the twenties when things were a little wilder. But yeah, so they were able to interpret sexuality in other ways without being sexual. Yeah, we need paintings and work. Uh, yes. <laughs> Which is fascinating to see what censorship was on the kids with yet. You know, Renaissance works. <laughs> mm -hmm. That lady's laying on Devon's naked. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I would much rather show my um, my stateliness with the double chin, as uh, Kevin once said. <laughs> <laughs> And I always say I have a tissue tissue. <laughs> <laughs> well, these were definitely fun to look at, but how about we get some other aspects of the exhibition, Mike? Right?
brought some jewelry in for us to exhibit. Can you tell us about that and why this was brought in? I can. <laughs> mm. Accessories and jewelry were as much a part of fashion then as they are now. If actually more so, because you dressed in different ways. There was you dressed for day, you dressed for dinner, and then you were dressed to go out in the evening. Uh, if you were doing a sport, you had a specific outfit for that. And you had accessories that went with everything. And those would change throughout the day. You would fix up your other outfit. But accessories are always like dessert on a meal. They fill it out. They finish it off. Or a wonderful digestive cocktail. <laughs> so I loaned some pieces from my family, little accessories and jewelry that kind of cover a gamut of periods uh, that would have, that would show the type of styles that would have been worn with some of these gowns. Um, there are pieces there from Cotillion that was an early form of social training, especially in the South. It's often mixed up with debutante ball, and it's not because Cotillion was attended by both young gentlemen and young ladies, and it's often the manners to go on and go forward to bloom in society and get ladies ready for the debutante. Uh, colors, styles come across the board, handbags, certain accessories such as cigarette cases, and even if I can get my little fingers on it here, because <laughs> I brought one more. Of course, it's buried in my pocket. Special surprises. Cigarette oh. holder. Oh, is that ivory? It is ivory, and onyx, and diamonds and gold. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, even, because smoking was so prevalent in that period use cigarette holders to keep ash from getting on their clothing. And also it just looks very elegant. So the cigarette was held further away. And the other thing too is manners of the day, you would never see a lady stand up and walk smoking. My own mother, to the day she passed, never did that. We always we sat. And it was just considered a vulgarity. So there was a whole set of fashion accessories that came around with smoking. Cigarette cases, special lighters, Ladies never lift their own cigarette. A gentleman was always there to do so. I found that really interesting when I was researching. So we uh, were loaned a gold and jade enamel cigarette box. And looking into the history of that, how a woman would never carry a box in her beautiful purse, but the fact that she would never carry a matching jewelry because the man never. was always expected mm -hmm. to light them for her. Oh, exactly. I thought that was so interesting because. Uh, I couldn't imagine just be like, all right, I'm going to sit when I have my little cigarette. You better light it for me. So that was the expectation. All that you had to do would be open your cigarette case, and there would be a gentleman there. Or if you were at a party, if not a gentleman, then some of the house staff or service staff would do it for you. You never carried that. And I believe that is in this case down here. I don't know if you want to zero in on any of that, or it's up to you. This so was the cigarette case there. I said a lady would never, you know, that and a hanky and a little bit of cash would be all that was, and a compact would be all that was in that bag. And there again, a bag like that was all hand beaded. The work would take months to do. Those beads are, some of them are about a millimeter, so more or less. And then you've got brooches and earrings, sweets, and the bracelet there that are very indicative of the period, um, and they are of the period. But you, would have worn something to accentuate each dress. Uh, this particular piece back here, this bracelet in shades of aquamarine and sapphire would actually look stunning with um, the, gown, yeah, the fringe wear. gown. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. mm -hmm. And then there are other cases of jewelry and accessories that you go down. Okay, so ask the story for uh, the red rhinestone. No, no, the um, the rhinestone, the white one that you're out on a date. <laughs> <laughs> Can we ask that story? Okay. <laughs> um, evidently, you can. Yay! I wasn't supposed the, to publish that, I guess. But. Part of it, you could, but part of it. <laughs> the, 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 the last, last part piece down there, there holds a necklace that my mother was given. It, uh, fortunately, it's later than the period that we're dealing here, because it's actually 1950s. But it has Art Deco lines. It's unsigned, so we can, I cannot date it to a specific period. But it very much has a Deco line and Egyptian revival tone to it. Um, my mother was to go out with a young gentleman, and he 
we arrived to pick her up in a pickup truck and jeans. Where was she living? In Kentucky. It's up. Mm -hmm. She was notified that he had arrived. She'd seen him arrive, and she told someone to go downstairs and tell him, I'm not going to. I do not ride in pickup trucks. <laughs> and when you dress appropriately, then we can go out. So later, he did ask her out again. This time he arrived in a proper automobile and dressed appropriately and brought her a gift in this beautiful necklace. She kept it all those years. Uh, stunning piece, why not? <laughs> when, I, when I was quite young, I, she was wearing it because it went exquisite with the gown that she was wearing. And I joked to my father, I said, does it bother you that she's wearing an old boyfriend's piece of jewelry? And he goes, hell no. I'm the one that wound up marrying her. I give her the real thing. <laughs> uh, it, it's just, it's, it kind of rounded, you know, like, so the pieces kind of rounded out the feeling of what women would have worn then. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, furs would have been another piece. You know, stoles were huge, mm -hmm. hats for day, and occasionally evening snoods. Am I forgetting anything? You're I don't the, think so. I think you covered it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm just going blah, 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 blah. There are people far, not, far more knowledgeable than I here. <laughs> yeah. but, and also going back to jewelry, so many of uh, the women of Hollywood like I said, they were wearing their own pieces of jewelry. Um, those famous designers of that era were Paul Flato, Raymond Yard. They did exquisite fine jewelry that often got copied. Um, Eisenberg was a company that was manufacturing. They were a dress manufacturer originally in the 20s and into the 30s. But each piece of their uh, attire came out with uh, normally a brooch or a necklace as part of it. They got out of the clothing business completely because people were buying them strictly for the jewelry. And their exquisite pieces, they're still highly collectible today. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so you else? <laughs> 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 Literally. <laughs> yes. So I'm with you in a turn next day fabulous. This is a good start. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's great. <laughs> well, we really appreciate all your knowledge, um, you and Rachel, too, sharing. Rachel is, we uh, do. is yes. a magnificent one being able. Yeah. <laughs> With her structural knowledge, historical knowledge, conservation knowledge, and it's just amazing. I I bow to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't have done this without either one of you. Yeah. It just, we it most greatly appreciate it. it. Makes us available to the public and for folks on tips and topics. And yes. It's just great we can share this. It, it's been great fun. Yeah, it's oh, been really been great fun, and I was flattered to be asked yeah. because you called me up. I was out of town when you called me. Yeah. So when you get back, can you come by and look at something? They're like, sure. Watch me. Oh, I want to surprise you. <laughs> okay. Don't be worried. <laughs> I hmm, evil torture devices. Uh, you know, all sorts of things going through my head. <laughs> The real things you'll find at the museum <laughs> until you get to the museum. <laughs> They're special rooms. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. And only special people get to go in them. <laughs> and that's why they don't exist. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not Tom and I. <laughs> yeah. and one of the things that we didn't cover today here, you know, aside from having all of these pictures of the actresses and information, along the sides of the room are movie magazines and blow ups of covers of those radio programs and books and all. And those were what supported all of the movies and also the fashion sold the movies in that day. And those magazines were the first ticket. Those magazines were somewhere around 25 cents, I believe, at that time, which not, was not an insignificant sum. No. And it also cost you that much to go see the actual movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, while we're on that topic, how much would an outfit, a normal outfit cost? Just give some reference for you. And then from a normal outfit that Let's say no classroom anywhere to one of the pieces. Well, it would vary greatly depending on the fabric and if she sewed herself, because going back to the magazines, you could buy patterns for mm -hmm. either some of these gowns or a more stripped down version mm -hmm. of many of the things that the Hollywood stars wore that were more adaptable to everyday life. Um, in today's dollars to recreate most of these gowns, 50,000 mm -hmm. per. Yeah. Gown because all of this was handwork done. Um, 
so many people back then, they could sew themselves or they had their own dressmaker and they would go to them. But there again, a Maggie Roan day suit in 1928 would be $1,200 at that point. Yeah. But the fun thing was, if you still had that day suit today, you could still wear it because it's such a classic line and it's such phenomenal quality. Mm -hmm. You were buying and paying for quality that we don't find today. We have throwaway fast fashion. These are timeless treasures that you can just sit back in your closet. Yeah. Would you say that throwaway fashion started in the 60s when things became? Pretty much. Okay. So Pretty much. Like the space race and then the plastics. And well, the plastics were actually things. big in the 20s, 30s, and 40s with Bakelite jewelry and all of that and uh, cellular. The 60s brought in the dress down period because prior to that, a woman would and never leave the house without being perfectly dressed, often with hat and gloves, accessories, face made up, and that's how she would go to the grocery store. You would, they would never think of going out in their pajamas without <laughs> the proper support garments underneath. <laughs> uh, that, that would be as foreign to them as you y'all putting on hoop skirts today and mm -hmm. us being mm -hmm. in breeches and tailcoats. <laughs> it was a more elegant era, but the 60s is what really changed that uh, with the hippie and the bohemian subculture that started in the 50s. So, and then it's just gone downhill ever since. And <laughs> if I see one more big yoga pant butt in Walmart, <laughs> I swear to God I'm going well, to take a Sharpie and make constellations on it so I have bail money ready. I think you're going to see more than there. one. Uh, <laughs> And I shouldn't throw stones because Lord knows the last time I saw the entire inside of a gym was uh, <laughs> the Bush Senior Administration. <laughs> but at least I have enough good sense not to go out and white yoga. Yes. <laughs> 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 both of you guys coming for this wonderful installment of Tipsy Topics. We do, and the good news is this exists up until this exhibit is up until August the 9th. Is that right? Don't put me on the spot for my own exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> August the 8th. 8th, 8th. No, it's August the 8th. Yes, yeah, so August the 8th. So it's one day off. We won't be here on the 9th. But through August the 8th, which is several more weeks, you can come see this fabulous collection of Hollywood dresses and the other material along with it. And we're excited. We have a couple of programs coming along in July that complement this. On Wednesday, July the 14th, Terry Hughes, who's the president of the Vanderbilt County Historical Society, also very much a film aficionado and a retired educator with the Evansville Vanderbilt School Corporation, he and myself are going to be leading a walking tour through downtown Evansville, looking at historic theaters and hotels of downtown Evansville. Terry looking at the theaters, myself looking at the hotels. Most of them aren't there, but looking at the site, some of them that still exist, such as the Victory and the Sontag and the McCurdy, uh, but others like the Grand Theater and the Orpheum and the Strand, where the stars of this era we've been looking at today, the 1930s, their films sort of being shown on the silver screen. So that'll be on July the 14th at 6 p.m., leaning from the, leaving from the corner of First and Locust Street, just across from Myriad or the old McCurdy Hotel. And for a couple of hours, we're going to journey back through the past of Evansville, weaving our way up and down Main Street. And then eight days later on Thursday, July the 22nd at 6 p.m. here at the Evansville Museum, we're very excited that Annette Bohannick is going to be here. And she is a film historian, a PhD, and she teaches at Purdue University. Ooh. Yay! Boy, <laughs> oh, I can't believe I said yay. <laughs> but no, we're, we are so excited that she's going to be here. She has a website come called From Hometown to Hollywood. She's appeared on national television speaking about how stars of the 30s made their way from hometown to Hollywood. And she's an expert and she's going to bring her uh, knowledge and a presentation here at the Evansville Museum on the evening of July the 22nd. She'll be speaking in our Cook Immersive Theater. And we're just so excited about yes. that. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, and we've had the opportunity to meet her on Zoom and we're looking forward to having Annette here on July 22nd. 
So we have all these fun things happening. It's really fun. We're here. We don't have masks on. We're live <laughs> and in person. And the museum is now open. What are we open? Thursday, Friday, Friday Saturday, Saturday, and Sunday. Sunday. Monday. Sunday, 12 to 5. The other day is 11 to 5. So come see us. We're open. We're welcoming you to come back and see your special place on the river, the Evansville Museum of Arts, History, and Science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>